Bonjour. Um, it's not good to start a talk with an apology, but I am so apologetically Anglophone, so if you'll please forgive me. Um, but I would like to um, maybe rewind and start by thanking Mark for the really generous and exciting invitation. I'm so very pleased to be here. Thank you, Mark. And I'm looking forward to um, collaborations with Franz and Sabrina, uh, and also to see uh, an old friend, Audrey. So thank you very much for, for welcoming me. Uh, so today we're in this room, and we don't often, I, I mean, I bet you do, but not all of us sort of think about the room that we're in and what we're just picking up from the room. So I'm looking around the room, and I see that there are vinyl tiles um, that are um, that have phthalates in them to allow for a plasticizer, and I know that we're all exposed and have the chemicals, uh, the plasticizer that's in the tiles in us. And I see that there are electronics here, and I, uh, all the wiring and the projector and the computer. And I know that all of those have both plasticizers and a lot of flame retardants in them. And they're in us as well. So people have been looking at their adverse health effects and including modeling their adverse health effects, like Mark has uh, been doing, or measuring them in the workplace, like Franz and Sabrina will be doing. Uh, and that's what I'd like to talk to share with you today. So um, my talk is chemicals in really the um, our surroundings. And the theme is um, solving one problem and substituting another problem. Now I'd like to uh, thank my lab group members. I won't go through all their names and various uh, funding sources, but I would like to draw attention to my wonderful collaborators, Lisa Yontanen from Environment Canada, Paul Helm from Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Arlene Bloom from Green Science Policy, who is an uh, inspiration to me, and Shelley Harris from Cancer Care Ontario. So several years ago, there was a fire in uh, Quebec, in uh, Lille Verge, in a senior's home that claimed the lives of uh, several senior citizens. Uh, and then about a year and a half ago, there was um, uh, a fire uh, also in a senior's home in uh, uh, just outside Toronto. So fires are always with us and are do cause a lot of damage, cause deaths, and cause a lot of injury. One response to this has been to add chemical flame retardants to products. The goal is to reduce the flammability of products. Does anybody have a Samsung 7 Galaxy phone? <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> just checking. <laughs> it's not a Note 7, though. Okay. <laughs> so because just about everybody understood that, you know the problem then of self-combusting products and that you don't want the product to combust, especially if you've got it in your suit jacket, uh, like Mark does. Um, so <laughs> one response, as I say, is to add flame retardants. So flame retardants are added to a very wide array of products, including, um, as I said, the electronics in this room. Well, flame retardants are big business, and they're a very lucrative business. So these statistics show in thousands of tons from zero up to 1,200, thousands of tons, the sales of flame retardants from 2002 projected to 2018. You can see that the sales have gone up from 1 million. It's doubled in 10 years, right, from 2002 until 2012. So um, most of that production you see is happening in Asia, Pacific, where so many of our products uh, now originate, uh, and then those products, uh, some of them come back to us. So, big business. Well, um, how many of you are aware of um, this set of compounds, polybrominated diphenyl ethers? Okay, a lot of people are, so for those who aren't, this compound, which is, uh, well, that's the general structure of it. Uh, was widely used in a in a in an array of products. Everything from your um, 
couch at home to your electronics to um, uh, if you were a nursing mother, um, nursing pads and uh, baby things for babies and so on. This very iconic graph was published in 2004. So let me draw your attention to the fact that this is a log scale. So in other words, the data over time are exponentially increasing. So these are PBDE concentrations in human tissues, human blood, milk, and, and other tissues. This is total PBDE concentration that had a doubling time of five years. So every five years, the concentration was doubling. And what was also notable about this is that the North American concentrations, particularly in the US, were substantially higher than European concentrations. As a result of this, first the US moved to remove two sets of mixtures in 2004. Canada had a draft assessment in 2006. Then Canada passed regulations in 2009 to stop the use of, the, of two formulations in new products. In response to that, or, and some of the health effects, as you know, it takes longer to determine health effects than to do the measurements of actual exposure or occurrence. So the health effects continue to be uh, understood. Uh, certainly, PBDEs are known to uh, modulate uh, endocrine levels, uh, and the outcomes of endocrine modulation are seen in several um, epidemiological studies, decreased cognitive function, decreased fine motor skills, cognition, attention, hyperactivity uh, disorder. So uh, a range of um, neurodevelopmental adverse effects, as seen in an epidemiological study. And as a, a, a journalist said, if you see it in an epidemiological study, it's huge. And that wasn't meant to be critical of epidemiological studies, just so you, so you know. Okay. So, because, so, um, the fact that um, the flame retardants are in products is because of flammability standards, which I'm going to go into. But you probably know the whole idea of standards uh, because of, um, for example, if you play hockey, the hockey helmet will usually say CSA, blah, you know, which is Canadian Standards Association, so that it fits a standard uh, that, you know, for impact or your bike helmet uh, or um, the fact that screws all come in the same size is because of standards. Okay. So, there are standards for flammability. Because the PBDEs were banned, then replacements were brought in. And the replacements here are organophosphate flame retardants. So I'm going to use the acronym OPEs. Uh, nobody knows the real production rates or how much is used, but uh, this was a report that came out uh, from the Global Chinese, China Flame Retardant Industry Report. came out, uh, I think, about a year and a half ago. So I will read what this says. With obvious advantages like environmental friendliness and safety, organophosphorus flame retardant is gradually substituting for halogen flame retardant. So here they're talking about like, PBDEs. With market volume of global organophosphorus flame retardant in 2010-2013, representing a cumulative annual growth rate of 10%. So this is an annual growth rate of 10%. And in 2013 alone, the market volume of organophosphorus flame retardant reached some 620 kilotons, or 620,000 tons, accounting for 30% of the global total. So 10% increase every year in usage, and I draw your attention to the wording, environmental friendliness and safety. Could you imagine, uh, for those of us who write scientific papers, can you imagine putting that uh, in a paper without a reference? Okay, so uh, we're going to be continuing down the road to sort of expand on this, gee, are they environmentally friendly and safe? Well, we know that people uh, are, are, are highly exposed. 
This is uh, one set of data that came out in the fall uh, from uh, 28 moms and kids uh, from California where the flammability standards are particularly uh, stringent. Uh, so this is the concentration in nanograms per mil in um, urine, uh, specific gravity normalized between the mom and the kid, mom and kid, mom and kid. And this is for, um, so one thing I have to say in this talk, it's hard to know which chemical is which because of the acronyms. So you're not going to remember all the acronyms, I'm quite sure. But... Um, these are different organophosphorus compounds, and I will draw your attention to some of them afterwards. But just believe me, these are several organophosphorus compounds. And again, we have a log scale. Um, as we saw for the brominated compounds, kids have higher exposure than moms, usually because of breastfeeding, lactational uh, transfer, that something that Mark has been working on and also because of uh, higher exposure through, uh, through dust, ingestion. And, yeah. So there, are, there have been concerns about the toxicity of these compounds. And at first, the, the concerns were driven by the fact that, um, th so this is one organophosphate compound, TSEP. Because of um, TSEP, it's got this organophosphate this is the phosphate group here. And here we have chlorpyrifos, which is an organophosphate insecticide. Uh, here's the phosphate group. Chlorpyrifos and the other organophosphates have come under a lot of scrutiny for adverse health effects. And uh, here I have to check my dates, but I believe it was uh, 2015 that, um, no, it was uh, 2016, that chlorpyrifos was banned for use in indoor applications in the U.S. because of mounting evidence of neurotoxicity. And there the evidence is really very strong. Uh, Canada has not banned the organophosphates from indoor use. Uh, and the U.S. EPA, at least before Trump was uh, elected, was considering banning um, the organophosphates for use on any uh, food materials. So the evidence uh, so far uh, is that uh, a number of the compounds are suspected uh, carcinogens. Some are, uh, um, have evidence of uh, developmental toxicity. Some, uh, there are questions of neurotoxicity, which would follow from uh, endocrine disruption and uh, alteration of hormone levels. Here's another one that is a reproductive uh, toxin. So there's, uh, there's preliminary evidence, certainly evidence of widespread exposure, but the toxicity of the compounds. A lot of the uh, tox work was done quite early on. Um, but uh, just this fall, a couple of months ago, the Can under the Canadian Chemical Management Plan, well, actually TSEP regulations uh, were passed in 2014 prohibiting this compound in kids' foam products. And then um, just a couple of months ago, TCPP was proposed to be designated as toxic under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act with restrictions on its use in mattresses, thinking that mattresses were going to provide the greatest and most immediate route of exposure. So that's just the preamble, and I see I better hurry up. So this is what I'd like to take you through today. This is our conceptual model of um, how the world works when you have chemicals. So first, there's this very technical um, box here called Stuff. And that's just all sorts of products that we have. Um, the body, the mass of stuff. And then within this mass of stuff are flame retardants. So the flame retardants, most of them are not chemically bonded, so they have the opportunity to migrate out of the product to which they were added. And the first place they migrate is the indoor environment, and that's because most of the products are indoors. Then I'm going to talk about its route with respect to clothing and how that res uh, can result in human exposure. I'm not going to talk about the rest of the um, of the model today, but particularly if the compound is persistent and bioaccumulative, then there are opportunities for exposure through, say, uh, eating fish, 
Um, and then we're also concerned about the movement of chemicals to the Arctic. So I'm going to be following mostly... Oh, right, and I have to add this. So I'm going to end the talk with a discussion of um, regulations because I think that the science we do has to have impact. It's not just good enough to sit and talk. So I'm going to be talking mostly about this route today. So f starting with the indoor environment, uh, we're finishing up a study with Shelley Harris. It's funded by Health Canada, looking at 51 homes uh, in the Toronto and Ottawa areas. Um, uh, so these are samples, 90, we did 90 indoor air measurement samples, uh, and these are the median air concentrations. Th these are the organophosphates. And first, I'm going to take you up here. These are the banned compounds here, and the air concentrations reach, let's say, 30 picogram per meter cubed. And when we come down to the organophosphorus compounds, same scale, picogram per meter cubed, but here the concentrations go up to 1,600, so 500 times higher air concentrations of the organophosphates. Uh, and it's predominantly this compound, right, which we're concerned about as a potential carcinogen and for um, neurodevelopmental toxicity. And we also get quite a bit of this one, which uh, has also been uh, recently banned from uh, kids' products, and then lower concentrations of the others. So the take-home message is, at least in terms of air, the concentrations are quite high. So where are they coming from? So this one, TSEP, is in all sorts of building material and foam, and that's why the ban on, say, um, using it in kids' products, in kids' um, like uh, foam toys and um, uh, nursing pillows and anything that a kid would come into contact with. Uh, this one here, which is, I'm going to follow, we're going to follow this one more closely, TCPP. So that one, remember, is ju has just been come up for uh, recommendation for controls. This one is in spray and solid foam insulation, polyurethane foam insulation. How many people have polyurethane foam insulation in their house? Especially the spray foam, you know, when you, are, you go, oh, there's a leak around the windows. So you take the, you shake it up, right? And you go, <laughs> okay, right, well, guess what you're getting? <laughs> Surprise! Uh, but it's also in foam furniture. Um, this compound is a plasticizer. So do, do you have a screen, like your computer screen, and it's a little squishy, you press your finger in and it sort of bounces back? So that's this chemical here, uh, triphenylphosphate, but it's used also as a plasticizer. It's used as a plasticizer and as a flame retardant. Uh, and then this one is definitely used as a floor wax. So I see the floor is really shiny, and I bet there is TBEP in the wax on this floor. So we have a suspicion that a lot of the chemical is coming from building insulation because we went into a very highly insulated home, state-of-the-art insulated home, and we measured quite high. This is nanograms, so the previous one was picograms. We measured so about 23, uh, or 23 nanogram per meter cubed of um, TCPP in this. This had both the rigid and the spray foam. So the pink rigid foam and the blue rigid foam and the spray stuff, all the polyurethane foam has uh, from 2 to 25 percent TCPP in it, available for migration. And this is just to provide some uh, uh, context. Okay, so we've got these chemicals in the air. Where is it going to next? So we asked the question, uh, what about our clothing? Because I always like working on questions that are sort of obvious, but nobody else is working on. Um, and everybody's pretty well wears clothing. Some people don't. I get it. But most people do, especially in the workplace. So we wanted to know... <laughs> Um, what's the effect of clothing? Uh, so this is Amandeep Sanai's PhD, and she, we were asking the question, clothing, and then we wash it, and then does it get into the fish? Oh. 
That's what the next group of slides are. So this is Aman and Clara Tyson and uh, Sumandal. And we they did an up, if you know how researchers say we did, but you know that it's actually the grad students because you didn't actually touch anything really to do with the study. They deployed fabrics in, uh, in an office and we also deployed fabrics in a home. And just want to tell you a little bit about fabrics. Uh, so, we've got cotton and polyester. Cotton is, uh, is made of glucose. It's a polysaccharide. So cotton, it's got these polar, so glucose is quite polar. See, so it's got these OH, uh, uh, the hydroxyl there. Uh, so it's quite polar. And by the way, wool is a protein. So anything wool and silk is a protein. So a fairly polar. Um, material. Now, in common, in contrast, polyester doesn't actually mean anything chemically, but the most common type of polyester is a terephthalate, uh, uh, which uh, this is what the structure looks like. So it's much uh, less polar. So what we found is um, we, <laughs> well, Aman, set these fabrics out for uh, for a month. Uh, both the, um, here we have the cotton in green and polyester in blue. The top are phthalates. These are brominated flame retardants and these are organophosphorus flame retardants. So a whole bunch of different ones. So let me just draw your attention to a few things. First of all, let's look at the scale. So this is a nanogram per decimeter squared per fabric and for the phthalates it goes up to about a thousand. For the brominated flame retardants, this is a log scale and it's going from 0 0.1 and barely reaches up to 100. So um, at least um, 10, 50 times, 100 times less than the phthalates. The phthalates are very ubiquitous. This is the one then that's, these two are the ones that are likely in the tiles in this room. Uh, and then we've got the organophosphate. So here it's a log scale, but this is going from 1 to 10,000. Uh, with the concentrations around 1,000. So around about the same concentrations as phthalates. So that's the first thing. So a lot more, um, uh, at least um, 10 to 100 times um, to uh, higher concentrations of the replacements relative to the brominated compounds. The next thing I want to draw your attention to are the bars with the uh, stars. So for those, the cotton accumulates more than polyester. So, you know, I'm wearing a cotton dress and I, I know that a, a bunch of people, you like you really like cotton, right? Because it's good and it's healthy and it's just, it feels right. Well, sorry. It, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid to say, but um, the organophosphates bind more to the cotton than to polyester. I really did not expect this, and we weren't happy about it, but as a scientist, you report what you find. Um, so, because we think these are very polar compounds absorbing more to the polar um, cotton. So, what we found is that two, cent two meters squared of clothing, which is what um, we typically wear, although I don't know if that really pertains to some of us who are more compact in height. But anyways, that's what the statistics say, is that uh, we typically wear two meters squared of clothing, um, can sequester the equivalent amount of chemical in a hundred meter cubed of air every day. Clothing has a really, really high sorptive capacity. Um, and at least for the PBDEs, uh, it will take a hugely long time for them to come to equilibrium. So they may never come to equilibrium given trends in fast fashion. So what about human exposure? So this is really interesting. We did a calculation um, that we found uh, that Glenn Morrison had did, but it's based on US EPA. Uh, and this is exposure expressed in nanogram per kilogram body weight per day, and it goes from zero to 7,000. So the first set of bars are for uh, a toddler mouthing fabric. So I don't know if you remember or if you have a kid who sucks on either, how many kids sucked on their sleeve or their blanket? I, mine was the blanket. 
Uh, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this. Hopefully you won't hold it against me. Uh, so um, this scenario is for a fabric, for our fabrics that were deployed for 30 days. So it is a worst case scenario. This is for cotton and polyester. This is for average mouthing frequency and maximum mouthing frequency. Uh, because the cotton accumulates more than the polyester, then the kid is getting more uh, transfer as a result of uh, mouthing cotton than poly. Uh, and the cotton also, because these chemicals are so soluble, they just come off in the saliva. They're easily solubilized in comparison to the PBDEs that are both lower level and less soluble. So we were quite amazed at the potential for uh, exposure, which could go up to three to, uh, to six. So this is a nanogram. That could be microgram. Now, in comparison, we've got dermal exposure, uh, um, inhalation, and dust ingestion. So dust ingestion has been important for PBDEs that are uh, more hydrophobic and uh, accumulate in dust. These organophosphates uh, tend to be more in the air, and hence inhalation is more important. And dermal here, but that's only looking at the exposed skin area. So um, the Lowell for TCPP, this is predominantly TCPP, like about 70%. So the Lowell is between 52 and 99 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. So it's substantially, it's about a, um, a thousand times higher than the um, estimated uh, intake. Sorry, it's not a thousand times. Yeah, a thousand times. Um, so it's quite a bit lower than the Lowell, but I expect that the Lowell is going to change. Because this, these are down. Uh, this is quite uh, preliminary yet. In terms of dermal transfer, the reason why we're concerned is because dermal transfer is higher for more soluble compounds. So this is work by Mohammed Abdallah et al. at University of Birmingham, and this is he. What they did is that they used um, uh, skin, um, artificial skin cells, uh, uh, put, applied the chemical on top and looked at how much went, was retained in the skin and how much went through to the fluid. These, this is the amount that actually goes through um, the skin to the receptor, and this is the amount that is retained in the skin. Here we have the organophosphates, which are more soluble and polar, which have substantially higher dermal transfer than the uh, brominated compounds. So I suspect that we'll see, uh, the, and so we get higher dermal transfer, but this doesn't account for clothing that we were discussing earlier. The hypothesis is then, and this is based on the clever experiments of Charlie Weschler, Len Morrison, et al., uh, that, uh, and certainly this is known, that when you have a chemical in air, it will um, partition into skin in a, in, just because it's an organic layer. Um, so any exposed skin and air, it'll partition. But as the occupational people well know, that if you impose a barrier, say, will you wear a lab coat? You wear a lab coat to prevent, um, to absorb the chemical and to prevent dermal transfer. So clean clothing, clean clothing acts as a barrier and will reduce dermal uptake. But in the experiment that Weschler and Morrison did, they exposed a bunch of guys in a chamber, uh, and uh, they had them wearing only underwear. I was not at the experiment. I would have loved to have been, but I wasn't. Uh, and so they found dermal uptake. Uh, they had breathing apparatus, so it was only from uh, air. Dermal uptake. Reduced uptake of phthalates because of clean clothing. And here they found enhanced uptake because of clothing that had already been dosed up, so to speak. So this exposure, the whole body dermal exposure here, was higher than the guys running around in the underwear. So we've yet to then probe what the significance is of people wearing clothing that's already dosed up, like my cotton clothing. OK, so uh, moving along then, what about in the city? What we found is that, uh, and this may be less interesting to you, but if you do laundry, as many people do, um, you can wash away the, so this is the percent distribution of chemicals. The blue is what washes away, and the yellow is what stays on your clothing. And here, the top one is uh, cotton, and the bottom is polyester. 
and it's pretty similar. For the uh, phthalates and for the OPs, they're fairly polar and most of it gets washed. So when you keep washing your clothing, your clothing will act as a barrier. But for the brominated compounds, they don't wash out because they're nonpolar. They just stick on the clothing. So you don't end up washing out the, um, or the brominated compounds. Um, as a result, the chemicals go into tributaries. These are some of our data. This is, um, uh, for those of you interested in ecotoxicology, these are concentrations of nanogram per liter. In other words, take away all the zeros and you've got microgram per liter levels. These are really high <laughs> in uh, surface water. Microgram per liter levels um, of, uh, in Toronto, these are Toronto um, streams and in wastewater treatment plants where we think a lot of this is coming from clothing. Okay, so um, moving along, what's the problem then? We have increased production volume, as I mentioned, 10% a year. Uh, high indoor concentrations. We have the uh, potential for clothing to accumulate these chemicals, of which only some are removed uh, from laundry. These chemicals are very mobile in air. Um, I didn't show you the results, but um, together with Lisa Yontanen, she's been measuring these compounds in Arctic air uh, and in water. And they, uh, some of them are relatively high, so they have potential for long-range transport. Uh, and there's definitely evidence of human and ecosystem exposure. So we definitely have to question the comment of environmental friendliness and safety. So with that, I'd like to move to and finish off, because I see my time's just about up, to policies and regulations and in Canada, because to me this is very interesting. So you know that there's, uh, we have provincial uh, um, regulations, but, mo but we also have um, under federal jurisdiction, under the, chemical, under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, we have the chemical management plan that says, this chemical can stay in the market and this can't. Okay, so, but of course they're saying if we restrict it, that's only on new things and the banned chemical will stay in homes until you buy something, a replacement. Well, for your couch, I don't know about you, but I don't replace my couch very often. So my couch certainly has banned PBDEs in them. Then we have, I mentioned these flammability standards. So I'll tell you what's really interesting. These two people don't talk. So the standard setting process, I just want you to know that it's complicated and we're not going to go through this because I want to stay friends with you and I don't want to bore you. I just want to tell you though that standards are set. They were developed like for hockey helmets and screws and screwdrivers and stuff like that. So a company, an industry has to pay a standard setting body such as the Canadian Standards Association or Underwriters Laboratory to write a standard. It's not a government process. It's a private company has to engage a standard setting body. Okay. And then there is some oversight. Now, a company like Underwriters Laboratory not only sets standards, but it also does product testing. So it's got a financial interest in the standards that it sets. So, um, what data are presented, for example? So I want to, oh, right, I have to go back a sec. So I've been showing you the, the TVs, right? I've got, oh, I got the slide in order. So why the TVs? So I'm going to go back over why the TVs. Okay. So TVs have some of the highest flame retardant levels of all products, except for the food dehydrator that we happen to come across. So TVs uh, over here um, have like up to 10% flame retardants in the exterior polymer, like this, this casing here. And the, only, the other products that we've come across that are higher are, is the building insulation. Um, and why? This is so ridiculous. So um, for those of us who are older, I don't know if you remember, they were these stupid giant 
cathode ray tube TVs, like with that, like the big, long, deep cathode ray tube. And you would turn it on and it would go click, 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 and then a minute later, the, the, uh, this image would come up. Well, of course, in North America, that's just not fast enough. So there was this new instant on technology for TVs so that you, the tube was always heated up. So this came in the late 70s, uh, sorry, in the late 60s and 70s. They hadn't worked out all the issues with these TVs, and some of them blew up. So there were some house fires with TVs. So as a result of this, this is 1974. As a result of the TVs blowing up, the Standard Setting Association said, okay, we need really stringent standards for TVs. So, fast forward to LCD and plasma TVs. Do you think the standard changed as a result of getting rid of the cathode ray tube? Of course not. So, that's why we have elevated levels of flame retardants in t monitors like this, which don't heat up as much as a cathode ray tube TV. Okay, so now going back to the flammability standard setting process. Uh, right. What's the type of data that uh, is submitted to this process where you and I can't go there because it's private and they don't release the information? So, for example, fire safety of TV sets and closed materials, da 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 da. Um, this was a very a small study done in one Swedish suburb, funded by oh the European Brominated Flame Retardant Industry Panel. Are there more data? No. So this should be astonishing to us because you you and I work so hard to produce high quality, excellent data for public scrutiny, and then these guys discuss in the back room without us being at the table what the flammability standard should be without scrutinizing the need for it and looking at it in a benefit-cost framework. Furthermore, who's involved? The flame retardant industry, and it turned out that Big Tobacco was, has been involved. And why Big Tobacco? So. A lot of the furniture fires way back in the 30s and the 40s could be traced to people leaving their cigarettes burning on the mattress or the couch. And why, in part? Not only because people were tired and fell asleep, but because the tobacco industry formulated always burn cigarettes. Otherwise, cigarettes, the tobacco, just normal tobacco, extinguishes if you, if you don't draw on it, if, if you don't take a puff. But the cigarette industry thought of a better way so that they would sell more cigarettes by having always-on cigarettes, like the TVs. So, the tobacco industry did not want to change its formulation and, God forbid, lose sales in cigarettes. So instead, the answer was to put flame retardants in couches and mattresses. Oh, my God. So, this came out in an award-winning set of... Um, of uh, articles in the Chicago Tribune in 2012. Okay, let's just fast forward now to today. What's going on right now? Like you think, okay, this is behind us. Let's move forward, right? Wrong. So this summer, we anticipate that there's, uh, I don't want to go into all the politics of this, but an international, there's an international proposal right now, and it comes up like every two years to increase the flammability standards of TVs that were already set because of the TVs in the 1970s that were blowing up. But they want to increase the flammability standard of, of TVs. Again, that's going to come up this summer, and neither you nor I will be at the table, and we won't be invited, and we won't, we'll hardly even know about those discussions. There's another process underway with Underwriters Laboratory uh, as the group uh, that is organizing this with the flame retardant industry at the table to increase the flammability standard for upholstered furniture in public places because of these two fires. If you read the record of why the deaths occurred, it was because of sprinkler malfunctions, it was because the people in the nursing homes didn't know how to deal with the fires. 
But in fact, some fire scientists say that people die from smoke inhalation. And the smoke inhalation is exacerbated by flame retardants, which reduce the combustion temperature and produce smolder conditions. You die from inhaling the fumes from the smolder conditions. I don't know where this is going, but I'll keep up the fight. Thank you very much.